Okay, Phoebe, I think uh, we can start. So I'm okay. going to make a short introduction. Okay. Um, I want to uh, say big thank you for Phoebe Bosco for being with us tonight. For us, it's already tonight because it's seven o'clock in London. It's, okay. it's four, so we're, <laughs> we're three hours. Phoebe is a wonderful uh, artist. I'm a huge fan since... Uh, uh, I, I came to Slade and Phoebe, I think, was two years above me. And uh, uh, I, I always uh, very much um, enjoyed uh, looking how Phoebe worked in his studios at the Slade School of Fine Art. And uh, uh, I followed uh, uh, her practice afterwards. And uh, we uh, even met in uh, Venice back in 2019 when she was um, showing her project as part of the Future Generation Art Prize. And uh, actually Phoebe is so kind that she's doing uh, uh, a second talk for us. The, the first one I think was back in, was it 2018? Something End of like 2018, that, yeah. I think. So uh, um, I've, I've shared your CV with the students, so hopefully they look through it, but uh, numerous amount of shows, residences, awards, and uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, as I said, she's a wonderful and very uh, established artist. And I'm very grateful again that she's uh, with us tonight. Okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> It's over to you. Amazing. Uh, just, just a quick, so uh, there is um, um, uh, students from my first year and second year. It's a CPG program that's specializing in uh, contemporary art practice. And uh, also students that studying uh, on, uh, um, it's the program, a year program in international strategies in art business. So oh, wow. uh, okay. So I, I, uh, I do lectures for them in art history and contemporary art. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Misha. That was very kind, a kind introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I'm just gonna this one. Um, hi, everyone. Um, wait, where is the... Slideshow. There we go. Okay. Um, perfect. So uh, it's lovely to be with you all. And I am very sorry. I. It's a very busy time. I'm. I just opened a show in London yesterday. I'm having an opening one in New York tomorrow. And I'm also preparing to go to New Orleans to start a very long um, installation um on the 8th so uh i haven't had much time to prep this but i found a talk and um i found some slides and there's probably way too much i'm not sure how long this we will go on for um but if you're bored let me know and i'll just like go on <laughs> i'm okay. sure we won't be bored <laughs> um so yeah, so I think I'm just going to give you like a very hopefully flowing tour um, of my practice from like the very early start up until now, up until lockdown, which you're all in now. So, um, so yeah, so my, I think I came to art because I didn't really know where I fit in the world. Um, I was born in Kenya. Um, my mother is Kikuyu Kenyan, my father is uh, British Kenyan, and we left Kenya when I was two um, and moved to the Gulf, to the Middle East. And I, so I grew up as an expatriate and I didn't know what my roots were. I didn't know what home was. And so art making for me was very much a way to um, figure out through perhaps looking at other people and thinking about other stories and thinking about my own story 
about like how to kind of place myself in the world. Um, I've always drawn and I've always drawn people and I have always been in love with the pencil. Uh, so this is from 2011, it's a very early drawing. Um, it's life size and um, it very much is a kind of indicative of my, like the heart I think of my, of my passion for making work. Uh, I think about drawing as this way of storytelling, illusion making. This is a series of drawings called um, Mechanics of Illusion. I was thinking about belief systems and how um, we can draw and we can know that something is just marks on a page. It's literally just, you know, we, we place marks onto a paper, but it, it can, allow us to go somewhere completely else and it can allow us to be wrapped up in the illusion of what we're, of what we're drawing. Um, so we begin with this work. Uh, it's from 2014 and it's called The Matter of Memory. Um, I had just, no, I'd finished at the Slade and I, and when I finished at the Slade, I really didn't know who I wanted to be as an artist. I didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to say. Um, I, because I didn't know what I wanted to say and I wasn't ready yet to explore myself in a very deep way, I instead just started to gather lots and lots of skills. So I knew I loved to draw. Then I knew I loved, um, drawing in space i loved drawing on the wall i loved moving things around in in this gallery space and and transforming spaces um i loved narratives and so i became i i became very excited about um moving drawings so i went and um went to saint martin's and i did a postgraduate diploma in 2D, 2D animation. Um, I didn't want to do a master's because I didn't want to write about animation. I wasn't interested in it in a intellectual way. I just wanted to make my drawings move and learn how to make my drawings move. So I went on a very intense uh, practical course um, where we learned the basics of um, traditional hand-drawn animation. I fell in love with it. Um, I fell in love with the process of, you know, the long process of drawing um, frame after frame. Um, so you'd have thousands of drawings to make one, one animation. Um, I also started to think more deeply about who I was, who I wanted to be, what I wanted to say. And the idea of home, and not having home, not knowing what home was, kept coming up for me in my work, but also personally. I was living in London and I didn't feel like I was from London. Um, I also didn't feel like I was from Kenya. So I decided that I wanted to go on this journey um, where I would interview my parents, both my parents, about their memories of home, of Kenya. And um, I thought that somehow within their memories, I would be able to find myself or at least take ownership of their memories and then be able to say more determinedly that I'm Kenyan. Um, I thought because my mother is African, she's black, my father is white, I thought that somehow I would, it would be very polar, like they would have my father's narrative and my mother's narrative, and I would find myself somewhere in the middle. But obviously, people are not linear, people are not straightforward, we don't exist in clean lines, we exist you know, in very messy ways, especially when it comes to love. And um, so, so, I, so I started to record them and it was an amazing 
process for me, it was an honor to, to hear them speak about their lives. And then I started to take little, little parts of their stories and I would use the skills that I had found. So I would either draw or I would animate, I would use clay, just anything that I had, I would start to build these very small narratives around their stories. Um, in, it became a very long project. It took two years. At many points I wanted to give up. I thought like, this is, you know, never gonna work. Um, and then eventually I had all of this stuff and I decided to place it in a recreation of my grandmother's living room, which is the only memory I have of Kenya. So I remade her living room and in these two chairs, in the arm of the chair, you can hear my father's voice in one and in the other, you can hear my mother's voice and you can hear my voice over the top um, re-saying their words um, and then the whole every part of it is so this this big um, window is it starts off being a view the view that I remember from my grandmother's house and then it very slowly as an animation it very 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 slowly morphs into a very rolling changing thing about land and landscape um, to do with the history of Kenya. Um, uh, no. Why is it not moving? Okay. Um, so that there were little everywhere in the in the installation there were little bits and pieces so this was a story my mother told me about living on a cattle farm and she always had milk to drink but because she had so much milk and not much else um this is an animation of a little girl um and it's projected onto a bowl of real milk uh, so every day the gallery would re-pour the milk and um, she's swimming playing in the milk this animation but she's also simultaneously maybe drowning in the milk so you're not sure whether it's a good thing a negative thing or a positive thing Phoebe sorry I missed uh, where was that show made which gallery so this was it, it first showed in Carol Fletcher in London, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, it was my first major show, I guess. And I showed with John Akomfra and mm -hmm. Richard Newsom. And then afterwards it went to Sweden and it showed at the Gothenburg Biennial. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first biennial. Um, so yeah, so little animations played out everywhere. This was a story my father told me, a very harrowing story. Um, uh, in every time I show the work, um, I draw a dying elephant um, life-size onto the gallery wall and I draw it, I place it according to the architecture of the space. So it becomes this process where obviously it's about um, I don't know if in Russian you have it, it, it we have this thing um the the elephant in the room and um and it's you know the things that exist in your living space that you don't necessarily talk about and in my family life there's a lot of things to do with the history of Kenya and colonialism that we don't talk about that is obviously there so every every time I show the work I draw um this elephant and and then there's a projection onto the elephant of flies and the flies are circulating around a wound and um i was very interested at the time between the idea of drawing and the idea of animation and how animation is alive drawing maybe is dead and and when you place the two together what happens and this kind of schism that happens um, so at the end of the show the drawing is destroyed so at the end of the show the drawing is destroyed but actually i went back to gothenburg recently to do another show and the technician who worked in that museum he was this like amazing really gruff guy like really like not a happy guy but um, he ended up keeping the head of the elephant 
And so when he went back, he was like, oh my God, I never thought we'd see you again. And he went and he showed me, he still has the, the head. He was like, I couldn't, I couldn't destroy so what, it. He just literally took part of the wall. Yeah, he took part oh. because it was like a, it was one of those partition walls. So he just All was right. able to, to break it. Um, so this is the wallpaper. Um, uh, it's like a custom wallpaper, so it's all hand drawn. Uh, I wanted it from a distance to look like, you know, old fashioned flowery wallpaper. And then when you go up close, it's actually DNA and um, figures like entwined on themselves. And these drawings are drawings from the family archive of memories. Um, this is a drawing of my two sets of grandparents meeting together and it's uh, important because it's a memory that never happened because they didn't want to meet because at the time it was still controversial for a black person and a white person to marry and so both sides were very anti the idea and so in, by drawing, drawing became this way of being able to say, imagine if this happened. And it's a thing that you can only do through drawing. You can't do it in any other way. So drawing becomes this very magical act where you're able to, you know, write the histories that were wrong, you know? Um, and grandparents from your father's side, they were, li they were also living in Kenya or... In yeah, because they were colonial settlers so they had oh. gone there in that very brutal way and they'd taken the land and so the whole thing was very messy um and i think in part my parents coming together was very much to do with like a radical re-imagining of what kenya could be where both of them were like imagine if we you know mm. we have children and the children don't have to be burdened by being on okay. one side or the other side. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so, ooh. So this is, can you hear that? Can you hear any sound? Mm, not really, no. Okay, it doesn't matter. So, th so yeah, it, I'll, this is just very short. I'll show you just, it's so funny seeing documentation now, like it's very badly documented, I'm sorry. <laughs> At the time, we thought it was really good, but we've all become better at documenting things. Yeah, for sure. So the project, uh, the space, was it commercial gallery space or, or it was non-commercial? So Car Carol Fletcher was, it was meant, it was, it said it was a commercial gallery. Um, they dealt mostly with new media. Um, uh, and, but they were more interested in doing really cool shows mm -hmm. then they were interested in selling so um i think that's why they don't exist <laughs> anymore <laughs> because their 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 program of shows was very exciting but it wasn't a sellable a sellable mm -hmm. notion um so this is a piece called dadangu um which is sister in swahili um uh, again, I was thinking about memory and uh, I was also thinking about geography. So um, my sister lives in um, the Gulf in Dubai. I live in London. My parents live in Zanzibar. So I asked my parents to um, put together photographs that they thought mattered the most and send them to me to London. And then I set up a rig um, and I recorded myself going through the photographs and talking about my memories of the photographs. Then I packed them and sent them to my sister, gave her the same instructions to make the rig and, um, and got her also to talk about the, the pictures. And so then the piece is two projectors. One is playing my sister's hands, one is playing my hands, and they're both on top of this table. Um, and so it feels like we're together in space, even though we're very, very far apart. And it feels like we're, you know, sorting through these memories together. But um, then there's speakers, one is my sister, one is me. And um, we're talking about 
the photos in very different ways. We have very different memories, even though we're the closest people to each other, but we remember things in ways that are, you know, factually very, very inconsistent. Um, maybe then there's some times where we are completely in sync with each other. Like there's a moment where we both pick up a picture and it reminds us of the same song and both of us, without knowing the other one did, would like we sing the song. So maybe uh, because the two videos are not linked, so they play however they want to play. So maybe once every couple of days in the gallery, this beautiful moment happens where we sing together, but it's completely to do with the technology of looping a projection. Um, and I was just thinking about how, yeah, how our, um, how we're very, uh, the concept of, of story and history and personal history is a very fragile, very movable thing that we can't rely on necessarily. Um, this is a piece called Transit Terminal. Um, I was thinking about migrations and um, there had just been a big crash of Lampedusa where um, 500 people, Africans trying to get across to Europe were killed um, in a shipwreck. And um, so I drew these figures um, onto these pillars that were like the shape and the size of an adult coffin. And on the inside, um, oh, this is in somewhere else. So on the inside um, of, of the coffins are these birds. So when you look at it from one way, you're very much within this crowd of um, faceless people. Um, and then uh, when you look at it from the other side, you're, you, you feel the sense of freedom, I guess, or like some kind of migration away from, from whatever is holding these people um, back. Um, this is a video work from 2019. Um, it's called I Dream of a Home I Cannot Know. Um, over many years, I would sit in the same place every time I went to Zanzibar. Um, I would sit on our beach and I would film whatever was happening. So this is a two channel video work and it is um, many, 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 many layers of sitting in the same place. And I was thinking about, and it's this kind of, I wanted to make this film that was kind of like a mirage. It was kind of like a thing that it exists, but does it really exist? It's a home place for me, but is it really home? Can it ever really be home? Um, uh, and it is a work that is on two channels, but it can be either horizontal, um, I mean vertical, it can either be vertical like this, and this was for a show in Gothenburg Konstal, it was a solo in Gothenburg Konstal, or it can be horizontal, um, you can see it here, um, which was for a recent show at New Art Exchange in Nottingham. So yeah, so here you can see the birds in flight. And I, because I love to draw on walls, so I extended the, the birds onto, onto the architecture of the space to create this even more of a sense of freedom, hopefully. Um, does it mean that sorry Phoebe does it mean that the the process of uh, preparing the show the installation basically extends because you need to basically work specifically on location and uh, make the drawings right on the spot yes and I love that like I I during COVID obviously we haven't been able to travel and I and so it's been very new to me to not go to the place where I'm showing um, and I'll show you um, later on the work that I've made during COVID and having to get someone else to touch the walls on my behalf has been a very interesting process. Um, I haven't enjoyed it very much, but I think it was very, it was very 
like fitting for COVID where we've all wanted to touch each other and we haven't been able to. So it was like a similar kind of energy. Um, I um, remember back from the days of the slate that you you always work specifically with the locations. I remember your great work in a in a kind of a hallway of a st staircases when you kind of installed your paper cut cutouts. Yeah, I mean it's it's been it's been a passion since then. I think it has to do with. Um, maybe because I don't know where home is. So when I go somewhere, I want to like really touch it. Like I want to <laughs> like make it mine and like transform it into my space, um, which is cool when I show you this, because this um, is for, it's at the Johnson Museum at Cornell University. And they invited me to project the, the video work onto the facade of the building. So it, so, it created a horizon which touched the horizon, the main horizon. So for me, this was like a, a massive dream. I never got, I didn't get to see it in real life, but um, but yeah, like touching walls, touching space is always such an important thing for me. Um, another really important thing in my practice is travel um, and residency. Um, I very much like getting out of London and going to places that I would never normally go. Um, I like the feeling of being a stranger in a place. I like the feeling of, of having to get to know that place and having to get to know whether that place is going to accept me also or, or welcome me and how they're going to welcome me so this is a piece called stranger in the village um, and i was on a residency my first international residency which was in sweden and i was told when i arrived that it was a very segregated society and so i was a little bit nervous coming from london where everything is very multicultural and the reason i stay in london is because I enjoy the diversity of, of the society here. So I was like a little concerned that I was gonna not be welcomed very kindly. Um, I decided I wanted to explore that. Um, and I thought that the easiest way, the quickest way to do that would be to go on Tinder. Do you have Tinder in Russia? Yeah. Okay, so I decided to go on Tinder because because it's completely based on your appearance and your location. So my studio was in the very rich center of the city and the very white center of the city. And then as you get, as you moved further out into the suburbs, it became increasingly more brown because the immigrant communities would live further out. But I was right in the center. So I thought, because Tinder, you can put a radius and then you just put your picture. So I, I decided to do that. And so I put my picture, I put Stranger in the Village as my tag. Stranger in the Village is an essay by James Baldwin, who is an African-American writer who wrote about being in Swiss village in like the 60s and all the different ways he was othered in that place. So it wasn't just racism, but it was also exoticizing, sexualizing, like doing all the things that make you feel like you don't belong. So it's not necessarily overtly racist, but it's all the different ways that you're just made to feel like you don't quite fit. Um, so, I, so I wanted to reference that essay and I wanted to see whether there was some truth in my experience through that essay. So yeah, so I put myself on Tinder and I started to swipe all the men, like everyone. I had no regard for, uh, for anything. And then, because also residencies are very lonely, uh, so there was something interesting also about that, like this thing what the Tinder does, like you're trying to create this intimacy through these strangers on like virtual sites. So, um, so every day I would pick someone who I swiped and I would spend 
hours drawing these very intimate portraits of these men, um, kind of willing this intimacy and like getting to know their faces through my cat through my phone so they're very small portraits they're a little bit like love miniatures you know and um and then i would document all the all the messages that came in to me once they started to speak to me and um and it was it started off like a bit of a joke like i wasn't taking this project very seriously and then it became more and more interesting to do with James Baldwin's essay about how I was perceived by the Swedish men. So, for example, um, I, it says, I've heard, uh, I said to someone, I've heard this place is very segregated. Is it true? And they say, yes, but you are quite fair skinned and sort of beautiful. So you will be OK. Swedes aren't racist, we just don't like ugly people. And he <laughs> says this to my <laughs> face. Um, so it became this very, and then there were different things like they would say, oh, you know, African women are so free with your bodies and it's a big fantasy to be, with, you know, and then like someone was like, you remind me of being on safari in Botswana and I saw a lion and you're like a lion, like roar, like literally like roar. Oh. <laughs> so it was like this very, um, it was like an onslaught. So the piece, then became all of these portraits with me in the middle and then they were positioned according to how far away they were from me and then on the wall directly onto the wall again I would write the um everything that was said to me um at the same time I was getting to know the city and I had the biggest studio I've ever had I'd ever had at the time and I wanted to do something that honored the fact that I had space finally so I got the biggest paper I could find it was seven meters long and I started to make this drawing that was um, a metaphorical journey from my studio into one of the immigrant suburbs and I, so I would every day I would go on the trams it's called tram line so I would go on the tram I would take my camera and I would just photograph everything and then um, uh, when I came back to the studio I would use these photographs that perhaps I hadn't noticed little things and then through drawing I was able to then like notice oh you know like this for example what can I show you in here like anyway um everything gave me a little bit of an insight into into the city in a way that then made me go off and research and then and then um it was at a time it was in 2015 um and there was like a big conversation happening in Europe around immigration so it so I started this work in April and then I was invited back to finish it in July and between those two dates, the questions around immigration had become more uh, demanding. And so the drawing suddenly became more um, vital in a way. And I started to include images like this of um, migrants who are trying to reach the shore. Um, this was a murder that had happened. So that it started to become more and more, um, loaded with like more political meaning rather than just me moving around the, a city that I didn't know. Um, uh, I then came back to London and this is a project called the likeness project um, where I was again still thinking about what it means to draw from your phone and what it means to have this online presence and where do we as physical people end and where does our digital life begin so um so i was thinking about self-portraiture and so these are my facebook profile pictures that gained the most likes so I drew them and they're, they're titled according to how many likes it 
received. Um, uh, then I was sent this image by a friend and my immediate feeling was, oh my God, what is happening to these women? What is being done to these women? And I was quite um, taken aback by this image. Um, she then sent me the story behind this photograph. And this is um, a place in Uganda uh, where the people, the Acholi people had been fighting um, land rights issues for a long time. They'd been fighting the government and corporations and they were about to lose their land to the state. And so they, uh, so the, on this day, the police had come to physically remove the people from the land. And the elderly women um, decided that enough is enough, men, no, like our men are not, they've tried to speak, they've tried to fight, it's not worked. Um, and in many African cultures, um, men seeing their mothers naked or their aunties naked is, um, is like a taboo, it's like a curse, because it reminds a man that they, no matter who you are or how powerful you are, you cannot be more powerful than a mother so then so the so the the belief is is that if you see your mother's naked you lose all your power so these women on this day had taken off all their clothes and they lay in the path and the men who had come to remove them freaked out and they ran away and so this image that initially I thought was you know, they are being violated, what is happening to them is actually a very heroic, very victorious image because these women affected history that day. And so I started to think about all of these different times where women have their bodies on the line when they're not allowed to use their voices. And um, I wanted to make a salute to women who do that I was also thinking about art history and how the female nude in art history, in Western art, uh, is mostly always drawn by men um, and is also um, always passive, always silent, always sexual, never voiced as, a, as an agent of, you know, their own um, determination, you know. So um, this is just another image of this. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to create this work where these, where um, I wanted to create this um, army of naked women who would be projected on all the walls of the gallery. So you walked in and you were confronted by these women. Um, I wanted the women to be real. I wanted their bodies to be real. I didn't want it to be like models with perfect bodies. So I put a call on social media for women to join my army. And all of these amazing women came towards me. And like, I was very surprised that everyone was, who said yes. So I had um, very important artists and thinkers and curators and all just wanting to come to the studio, each one for their own reason and engage with this project. So we, so they did, they would come into the studio individually and we would go on this journey of what it means to protest, what it feels like to protest, what it looks like in the body. And over time, we were developing this language um, around the idea of protest and the emotional states of protest. So these are stills from the animation. Um, it, it was a project that took nine months to make. Um, uh, and they Sorry, go, did, they, yeah. did they actually pose for you? Yeah, so, so they would come in and when they were ready, I mean, it was a bit pervy when you think about it now, because when they were ready, they would take their clothes off and I had my camera like, a, <laughs> I, go, I don't know, 
I don't know if I would be allowed to do it now, but at the time <laughs> it was fine. Um, and and I would give them provocations like, you know, let's think about resilience, let's think about sisterhood, let's think about shame, let's think about anger, what does anger look like? And I didn't want them to act, but I wanted them to use these prompts to see what happened in their bodies. So very much um, questions around censorship came up. And so this became part of the work, questions around strength and resilience so the idea of a forest of trees came up so eventually it, it becomes this forest of trees um and this is the final work um it's called mutumia which means woman in kikuyu which is my mother's tribe language my mother tongue um but the interesting thing about the word mutumia is that nowadays younger feminists are now saying oh mutumia actually means if you translate it directly it means the one whose lips are sealed and if you ask my mother my mum will say no no it just means woman but younger people are like no it means the one whose lips are sealed and mat like the word for man is like the brave warrior or whatever like some ridiculous thing so um so it's very, so th this was super interesting to me because I started to think about like what what how does a society deal with like how do women speak in a society if the very word for women that people don't even but like care to acknowledge the fact that the women means the one whose lips are sealed. So if you're constantly from birth being told you are the one whose lips are sealed, how do you ever learn to speak and how do you ever move to speak? So, um, so yeah, so this is the work. Um, this was the first version of it. It was commissioned for the Biennial of Moving Images in Geneva. Um, and it was shown in this place called Mamco. And um, it, it is, they're slightly larger than life size and they're projected onto all the walls and inside the floor are a series of hidden sensors like pressure sensors. And um, because the process of making was so, um, it was so important to how I was understanding the work because each woman brought with them such wisdom that went beyond my understanding of the work. Um, I wanted there to be this space for the voice. So, um, so each sensor is linked to a soundtrack. Some of it is the sound of the women speaking in my studio, but I also worked with a gospel choir. Um, I worked with uh, Kenyan women writers reading from their texts. So it became a, like a platform for women's voices to be heard. I had a conversation with my mother. I had conversations with different women. Every city the show goes to, we add voices of women from there. So, um, oh. You can't hear the sound though. No, 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 we can't. We, we're only seeing the pictures. I also I'm want to ask, did you, did, you include, did you include yourself? I did not include myself. <laughs> I didn't include myself. Is, can you hear it now? Yeah. Languages to demand the release of nationalist There is no speakers or <laughs> Rhythms to the <laughs> 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 
to impregnate. This carefully circulated and re-inscribes a legend of So, um, so yeah, so those were like excerpts of the work and it's a 30 minute loop. Um, so it's like a never ending loop, but it has its own, um, it kind of has a beginning, middle and end in a way. Um, and uh, the, so yeah, so when the, when the room is empty, then it's silent. But if you stand in the room, then you enable the voices to be heard. Um, I also wanted to give the audience the same opportunity to be in the work as the women. Um, so I so I wrote the same prompts that I had asked the women, which are taken from Audrey Lord's The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action. Um, I, I wrote them. This is it for the, every time I do it. It's slightly different because um, I'll do it according definitely to the space that I'm in. So this was for a show um, in Ukraine. Um, it was for the, it was in Kiev. It was for the Future Gen Prize. So instead of it being a, a round, it became a corridor. And the pressure sensors were all in the floor. Um, uh, so I put prompts and I also put charcoal because I wanted the audience to have the same thing that I had, which is um, pigment on paper. So they had charcoal and white, very white space. And I wanted to provoke them to think like, you can mark this place. Like it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it's a, you make the choice of what you want to do here. And um, in when I did this in, in Geneva, in Switzerland, no one wanted to touch the wall because everyone is very, you know, I don't know, like Swiss people follow rules and they like, it's a gallery, obviously we're not gonna make a mess. And then in, in Kiev, it became very quickly a space where people would come and write and um, draw. And uh, the only thing that I, I, spec I stipulated was that if anyone drew anything on the women, this would be immediately removed because of to honor and respect the women. But otherwise it became this very, very different work where these women are now standing rather than in this very celestial white space, they're now standing amongst this very chaotic space. And obviously, you can't control what people are going to say or write so there were very offensive things as well and it became and so the women standing there in protest suddenly became this very different um situation um uh that's i won a prize for that um and that that it was the future gen art prize and that then took the work to Venice 
um, and I showed it in this palazzo in Venice. But because there was something about um, work is very subversive. It's meant to be subversive. It's meant to push against the the dominant the male dominated space of the art gallery. Suddenly, I was being honored and awarded by the exact people I was trying to push against. And so I was like, what does this even mean? You know, like, how do we get free when we try and be free? And then the people who like it, who deny us our freedom, gift us for the very thing. And then it becomes something to do with them and their acceptance of our you know, subversion. So when I showed it in Venice, I didn't want there to be any sense of um, punk uh, graffiti, nothing like this, because I didn't want it to seem like co-opted, you know, by this, now it's become like a heralded, awarded artwork. So, in, and also the, the environment was very different. It was this palazzo, it was very beautiful. And so instead it became this very grand thing. The women were very large um, and the, the, the senses were on a stage. So you raised yourself to go on. So there was this idea of like this feeling of elevation that you as the audience had, um, as well as that, because I still wanted the audience to be able to be in the work separate room, um, I placed this, which was a self-recording mic, and I put the, the provocations there. And so people could go in here, they could press this button, they could record themselves, and what they recorded would go directly into one of the sensors on the, on the floor. Um, this was it in um, Brussels for Nuit Blanche, which is this like amazing uh, night of uh, moving image work. It was in a part, it was in this place called Park Royal. So it was an outdoor version. And um, actually this is in Gothenburg, but this, this was in uh, this place. And so, so th you, there's this gazebo here. And then when you're standing where I am, where we are, um, there was a, a men's club, like a members club for men. And so I chose this space because I wanted these men who come to this club that's only for men to have to walk through this corridor of women to get to their club. Um, but they decided to close that night. They were like, we don't want to do that. So, so they closed that night. But anyway, it was still like, I, it was still very much to do with this, like pushing against that space. Um, how long, how Sorry, are we for time? A couple, couple of two students wrote that they were crying when you, when you, when you basically said about this project, yeah. Aww. So I guess they were very touched. Tatiana and Radmila wrote in the Hello. chat. So you can look through the chat afterwards. I will. Thank you so much. I'm wondering about time. Are we still good for time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah? We'll be okay. good. Yeah. Um, so, um, so this is an extension of that work. Um, this is a, a photograph by Adrian Piper, who's an African American um, artist. And she did this. Thing. It's actually interesting now you're in lockdown. So she sequestered herself. She moved, she put herself out of society for a few months, a couple of months. Um, she lived in, a, in an attic and she was reading, I think, Kant. Um, and, and she every day would take a photograph of herself um, to remind herself that she still existed because she had, it went for so long that she didn't speak to anyone, see anyone, um, touch anyone. She wasn't touched by anyone. And so she started losing her sense of self. And so she would take these pho photographs every day of her naked self. And it was in part to remind herself that she existed, but also to do with how we take ownership of our bodies and um, remove the gaze from 
from a, like a Western art context of, of the female nude. So I've always been obsessed with this work. It's called Food for the Spirit. And um, so I did this thing where I asked women to adopt this pose and take a photograph of themselves. And then I drew these life-size drawings of them um, taken from their photographs. And for me in this drawing became about witness. It became about um, uh, care. It became something to do with, it could have been a photograph, but, but I see you and I'm going to spend the time to see you. And, um, but, I, but at the same time, I didn't want it to be that it, it becomes my drawing. So um, in the phone apparatus for taking the photograph is a hand-drawn QR code. Um, and in each code, uh, so each woman has complete control of that code and I don't have control of it. So they can program that code to whatever they want you as the audience to watch or read or listen to while you're looking at their naked bodies. So it was a way of them being as active and non-passive in the work as possible while still being the subject of the work. Um, they also titled their own drawings and um, and if there was anything that was important to them, um, it was placed here. Um, uh, and so uh, when I sorry, what was are there any examples of what was the QR codes leading to? So so it changed over time. Um, so they they still now have control of them. So anytime they want to, they can change it. So one woman, she kind of decided to make a kind of journal. So every day she would journal in this thing and you would read the journal. Um, other people put, put songs. So you'd have like a, because sound is such an evocative thing. So when you're looking at them, they would choose. Um, so for example, um, this woman uh, put, uh, Brenda Fassi's uh, Good Black Woman, which is like the most heart-wrenching song. Sometimes I do lectures and I finish with this image and I play what she wants you to hear. And like, it's just, a, it's a moment of complete elation um, when, when it happens. And when it happens um, privately, when it's just you looking at the work, I think it's a very powerful thing between you directly and her. Um, each one has a horizon and so when I showed them um, their horizons link up even though they're all in their separate worlds so and then I'm also thinking about how we view art like nowadays we go to museums and we all look at the art through our phones like this happens anyway and so I want I, I wanted to play with this that you're the voyeur and we're allowed to do that now because it's going to give you some extra something. Um, they're very fragile works because obviously, if if this is in this is in pencil, so if this smudges at all, then the QR doesn't work and the drawing is obsolete because it will no longer be functioning as a as the, as it was intended. Um, this was it at Tiwani Contemporary in London, um, again painting on the wall uh, and I framed them without glass so you get as close to them as possible and I also left um, traces of eraser marks like there was still the dust from the from the pencil and the eraser on the on the edge of the of the frame and um i'll talk about this again but um yeah it became this thing like i'm always interested in notions of care and how as an artist i choose to care for the people who i make the work about and for and i also request and require 
a level of care from the audience. So um, I trust that you're not going to harm the work, even though it's pencil paper and it's not glazed. There's no glass. Maybe do um, you title, did you title the work with the names of the models, people that you? Drew? No, I gave them permission to title them as what they wanted. Mm. So. Um, uh, I can't remember now what those what their titles are. Ah, okay, so this is called Some Other Sleeper. This one is called Mestizaje. Um, and this is called Is That a Question Mark Creature of Myth? And this person was very interesting, actually. Um, she was a pre-op trans woman. And when she came to me, um, she wasn't sure that that... Actually, I asked her to to be part of Mutumia, to, to give her voice to Mutumia. And it was, it was right at the moment in her transition where she was having like, she won't mind me saying this because, because she's spoken about it, about this work, but she was having um, not doubts, but she was very nervous about, about what was gonna happen next. And so then being part of this work, were and standing with these other women and being you know in this space that was uh that she she was able to just be was a was a very important part of her of her journey and and um yeah like so 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 yeah so they all they all um titled their own work mm. um <clears throat> then so that was 2017 and it was it had been a really good year like i was i just won this thing i'd just been in venice and i say this to say that life is a craziness and it really like you have to just kind of swing with what happens because straight after that show i had a very bad accident and I lost the sight in my eye my eye was was very badly damaged and I lost the sight in my eye and consequently because of the stress of this my heart broke and like physically broke and I ended up in this cardiac situation um, where I almost lost my life and um, it was a very dark time and I didn't know I like I lost the will to do anything I was like I don't even want to leave my house let alone go to the studio let alone make anything I'm not even sure I can draw anymore um, but I decided at some point uh, that I would go to the studio and I would draw an animation every day, the size of a heartbeat. So it, so it, it could just be like two drawings or three drawings, but it would make something that was a heartbeat and it would exist. It would be able to exist in and of itself, even though it was like a very quick thing to do. So I started doing that um, and it was helpful just to the process of going back to work but I realized that I was it very like animation you're very in your head about it like it's very you know hand eye it, it's very meticulous and I realized that I just needed like my body very much needed to let out a lot and um and while I was in the in the cardiac the, the heart hospital um there was a woman next to me in the bed next to me and she was very delirious and she was oh my gosh i'm so sorry i've got a delivery may i just get yeah, yeah, my yeah, yeah. i'm so sorry Let's one second a, Uh, 
I'm back. Great. Sorry. No worries. No worries. I'm um. Yeah, I'm prepping for this installation, so there's lots of going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, so yeah, so this woman was um, very delirious and she kept saying this thing in Urdu and uh, the nurses couldn't understand what she was saying, so they called her family and it turned out she was saying, take me to the lighthouse, take me to the lighthouse, take me to the lighthouse. And her family couldn't understand like what this meant Mm -hmm. whether there was maybe a lighthouse in her childhood and so they were trying to figure this out and I was meanwhile lying in bed next to her with like attached to all these machines and with this eye that was not working and I was thinking like where is my lighthouse so um so yeah so I, so I decided that I needed to start to um to draw in a way that perhaps was more visceral, more to do with my like muscle, you know, mm. emotional, nervous system, whatever. And um, I would draw um, these horizons. Um, oh, this is in, not in the order. But anyway. Um, What's happening? Wait one second. Okay, ignore that. Um, I don't know where these things are. They're in a very funny order. Okay, yes. So yeah, so I would draw these horizons. I thought that perhaps if I, um, every day I would draw whatever, however I was feeling and um, maybe somewhere on the end of the horizon, I would find something, some light or some. So these are very, very big. They're charcoal, pastel, and they just allowed me to be a bit more free. And I'd never really worked like this before, um, uh, but it was very, it was, it was very healing. It was really helpful to me. Um, I also, became very obsessed again with um, uh, self-portraits. I was, I couldn't find myself, like I, I couldn't see myself. Um, and so I would take like all these pictures on my phone, trying to recognize myself. Uh, but obviously when you take a picture on your phone, it flips you, so you're never right anyway. Um, and, uh, but I started drawing from these from these phone um, selfies, and I, like I, I include them here because I remember back to the very frivolous way I did self portraits before when I was thinking about like likes on Facebook, and suddenly like self portrait again becomes this this new uh, place for me to try and kind of understand something like much more deep I think and much more uh vital about um what drawing can do when you need it um this is can you hear that sound yeah yeah so this is uh, a piece called iflaf um which which means the space between the land and the sea um i was i went home to zanzibar to heal um after a while and I realized that how badly we, we don't understand how to do grief. Like we don't understand how to hold each other's pain and our, each other's grief very well. I think um, uh, certainly in, in this Western culture that I've grown up in, I, we, we get taught to hide it or to, you know, keep, calm and carry on and and not to not to allow it to affect you too deeply and I just couldn't um not it could it, I mean it was affecting me on levels that I never felt before so um and it was also affecting the, my loved ones so so when I went home um my dad is a very stiff upper lip English man and he was obviously struggling with what had happened to his daughter, but he couldn't 
say it. He couldn't speak it. And so he was just tense. And and he he used to be a pilot um, and he's always wanted a drone. So I bought him a drone as a gift. And I asked him, like, can we, can you help me to do this project? Um, I just want to place myself between the land and the sea every day. And so it, was a, it wasn't a good drone. So it, it only lasted for about 20 minutes. And every day and then we had to renew it so every day we would go out for 20 minutes um, and he would fly the drone and I would do my thing and uh, and it became this place for us to we both knew why we were there and we both knew that we were there to process this grief and this trauma that had happened but we didn't have to talk about it we didn't have to say any words we didn't have to, um, you know, like embarrass each other with the thing that we don't know how to do. Um, and so this work is a multi-channel video work um, that plays on these um, screens on the, on the ground. Um, uh, and so you look down, you look down onto them and they play at varying different uh, times on a loop. Um, this, then this work is a cluster of uh, different video works. Um, so in the center is, an, it's the footage of an operation I had on my eye. The surgeon is a bit of a rock star and he, I told him I was an artist and and he allowed me to let him film the operation. And then I manipulated it uh, into being this kind of, so blood looks a bit like ink. And uh, I wanted it to have this kind of feeling that it could be some kind of, uh, like it was quite an intense thing. I haven't seen this in quite a long time. But um, so this played, um, so this was called New Moon. This is my heart um, from an angiogram. And it reminded me of charcoal drawings that I would do. And I, and I, like when I saw it, I was like amazed that it looked like one of my drawings, like one of my animations. And so this is the exact footage of the heart. And you can see where, um, this is, I, I have spinal surgery, so this is like a thing, but you can see where it ruptured and um, it's called a broken heart. And then these two are called rapture and rupture and they, um, they are kind of mirrors of each other. Um, this one is trying to show what I see through my broken eye. And I was trying to like, again, in trying to locate myself via self portraiture, I realized like I couldn't, I wanted to see grief, like I wanted to see the trauma and my face wasn't doing it, like it was not allowing me to see it. So I started to think about um, how trauma is this collective thing. It's this very human thing. Uh, it exists in a, even in a cliche sense in love songs and pain songs. And um, so I uh, started to film myself um, singing the most emotionally sad cliche love songs that I could think of and um, just wanting to, and then playing it back over and over again to see if I could locate trauma in my face and in my body. Um, so this was the final work. This was at Autograph in London. Um, the seascapes became wallpapers um, these large wallpapers and then you walked inside this like little cocoon and the heart was on the floor, rapture and rupture on both sides and new moon was in the middle. Um, I also, again, thinking about um, the idea of the horizon, um, I was given, so, so all of this work like when I was making it, I wasn't really thinking about showing it. Like art became 
I cancelled everything. I cancelled all my shows. I cancelled all ev- anything that I had happening. And art became really just a lifeline. It became this way of surviving every day. Like if I just do something every day, then I won't want to not be around. Like I, it's it it sounds kind of a lot to say that, but like this was the reality of the situation. And um, and then um, this is Autograph in London. And the curator of Autograph is this woman called uh, Renee Musai. And we had talked earlier before the trauma happened, we talked about having a show there. And so because it was scheduled, she came to the studio. It was really bleak. Nothing good was happening. And she was just so kind and so thoughtful and human and started to talk to me about a way that I could kind of compute about what I was making and made me start to see it as this isn't just self-indulgence this is something maybe that has space outside perhaps if I can put it outside I can take it away from my body rather than it just being uh, a therapy that that you know just eats me in, in a way. Um, so, so it became this very loving curatorial project, very gentle, and we started to build this show. So this is Ithlaf, um, and that, this is the, the drone work. And then they gave me the space for 21 days prior to opening to just be there. And I created this horizon. I just put like tape and made a horizon. And then every day I would photograph myself in whatever mood I was in. And that would become the drawing of the day. And we didn't know where it was gonna go, how, like how it was gonna be. Um, uh, but it was a very cathartic experience because I could leave myself on the wall. Um, it's drawn in soft willow charcoal and it's not fixed. So again, thinking about tr- care and trust and how fragile it is. Like if you blew it, it would, like the pigment would be lifted. The pigment is, was, is all here. We left everything, all the different like little bits of charcoal, we left them on the floor. And so it was a very vulnerable piece. Uh, so it begins like this. So, so here's the horizon. Um, so this was day one. And then it was a very slow process every day. It would just grow a little bit. And I realized that in the making, I was getting stronger every time I would go back to that gallery. And um, yeah, like I can't say enough how important art is and how lucky we are to have it and to be able to put ourselves there and leave ourselves there. Um, you, Phoebe, did you feel pressure about the timing that you only have 21 days to create such a large... Uh, not really. So I so I jumped around. I, I, I jumped around according to how I was feeling in the space. So it wasn't that I did... It was like you start here and then it has to get there. So I would start and then I would go here. And even if it had just been one thing, it would have been fine because there was other stuff in the room. Like I, it, it was very much the opposite. Like, let's not feel any pressure. It will be whatever it is. And it ended up being a 27 meter long drawing. And it was a full, like everything was full. The only things, this was a photograph the only thing that wasn't in the same conceptual spirit of taking the photograph in the morning was this, which was in the center, which was the photograph that was taken the day my eye happened. So it was taken just before I went to surgery. And I wanted that to be there as a, as a witness, as a reminder. And then the other thing was, as I was doing this and I was feeling stronger and stronger, I started to really think about, um, little baby Phoebe and how this shouldn't have happened to her and how I was so sorry that this thing had happened to her. And um, I had this in my head while I was drawing, I had this picture that I was like, I don't even know if this is a real picture, but I, I remember it like I've, I have this memory of me 
sitting on like a potty. Um, so I drew this on a little scrap of paper while I was in the gallery and I sent it to my sister. And I was like, does this photograph exist? And she's amazing. And so immediately she found this. And I was like, it's true, little baby Phoebe. So this became like the anchor of the of the work, at also like a witness. So so there's all of the me's from now, and then little baby Phoebe is in the corner just watching and and knowing that it, you know, ultimately it's gonna be fine, like we're gonna be okay. Um uh the other thing in the gallery I wear these are tiny tiny like they're like one centimeter little tiny photographs uh because a thing that I hadn't understood about trauma was that your memories kind of disappear um and they become these like very abstract things and you start to forget that you ever had like a good life and you know like you forget so much and you become so compounded by this like dark grief and so in the gallery um like even just under like at the edge of a wall or somewhere in the bathroom there were just these tiny tiny little glints these little tiny glimmers of memory um that you might stumble across um then i did the same i did this uh for the solo in sweden so this is the same uh but obviously in a different formation again like i hate doing anything twice so when i do when i move places it also gives me an opportunity to think a little bit differently spatially spatially so this was the version that happened in sweden um i did a small wall drawing there um so just three me's um and in pastel um so I was like adding color for the first time, which was like new to me. And then I just wanted to show this because uh, this was this was 2015 um, in Sweet in the same museum in Sweden where I was in a group show. And this was for the matter of memory all those years ago um, where I was drawing on the wall. And then this was now um, drawing on the wall again in the same museum. And it was just like this really nice. Um, uh, connector that you know um in the end we're going to do what we want to do like these things are just going to keep coming back and back and back and like that's a wonderful thing and I um I'm just about in um New Orleans I'm about to engage with a another 20-day wall drawing which I'm super excited about um and yeah like that's just a very big part of my practice drawing on the walls um these I'll go a little bit quicker I think so so every time I was in the hospital so so after that episode after that thing happened life became much more about just being in waiting rooms hospital waiting rooms for like the majority of my time so I would take uh, paper and I would do these doodles and um over time I realized that I was creating this monocular army this army of women again um these helmeted like maybe astronauts like with these one-eyed women trying to maybe i was creating a an army to kind of support me through this thing that i was like having to get used to um which was yeah like seeing differently being seen differently it affected in ways that like kind of went beyond. Oh. Um, and then uh, I was given the opportunity by Theaster Gates um, uh, to do this thing called Coll Collective Intimacy, where we were, um, where I was able to devise some performances um, for Prada for Freeze Week. Um, in, in conjunction with the showroom gallery in London. So I invited um, women who I admire. So this is Zoe Whitley, she's the head of Chisholm Hill. Um, everyone here, this is Claudette Johnson, she's one of my favorite artists. This is Rihanna Jade Parker. She's uh, this amazingly important young uh, 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 art historian critique. critic. Um, 
and I invited them to bring their gospels, bring like the thing that they they read in order to heal themselves. And we went through this thing where we tried to learn how we were going to read together and what it meant to read together. And I wanted to see it as this, and it was called The Lighthouse. Um, so I was still thinking along those terms of The Lighthouse. And I wanted it to be a thing where it was a performance, but it was for us. So the audience mattered less. The audience came towards us rather than we performed for them. And it was very much about us experiencing what it is to read together. Um, it then expanded more, more people. It went into this bigger space um, uh, and became a more robust thing. Um, and then I was invited to do it again. And I, again, I don't like doing anything too many times. So I decided I would do this other thing where I would invite my mother, who happened to be in London at the time, um, to read with me. And uh, it was called Mothering Memory. And we went back to the matter of memory from all those years ago and went back to her transcript um, and read her transcript together. And it was really interesting because obviously that her memories, memories don't change, but she has changed, I think, around them. So it was interesting for her to go back to the things she said in 2012. Um, and then it was also interesting to say them without my dad's voice being present. So it became much more about her and me determining who we were as two women who had shared experience and very different experiences of life. And um, so we read together um, and it was one of the most cherished things I'll ever do. And um, yeah, like art is so nice because it gives you these opportunities. Um, this is called, um, I need to believe the world is still beautiful, which was a phrase from Sammy, the trans woman who I introduced you to earlier, said in Mutumia. And, um, and uh, this is a three channel work um, and it is based on outtakes from the document, the, not the documentation, so this was one of the women who was in Mutumia. And so these, these were recordings from the footage that I used to draw Mutumia. And uh, so I repurposed them into this work that was looking at joy, black woman joy, um, how we get free, how we can be free, how we become like icons of, of uh, freedom <laughs> and it's just a really beautiful work um, I love it because it so embodies this woman and I feel like it really embodies um, women in general um, Bui who it's of is a young writer and so every time I show the work I ask her what she wants to say in that work in that time in that moment and um, so she writes what she wants to say and then we write it um, on the black. So we write it in black on black. So it is, it's like a very, it's like a texture, like you, you might miss it, but if you want to look, you'll, you'll find it. So this was an example of what we wanted to say. We move mad with such grace, black women, when we remember, when we remember we are the living embodiment of God consciousness, we are unstoppable, unfuckwittable. I need to believe the world is still beautiful because I love black women, black women folk, black women, black trans women remind me to notice the care I take with myself, the ones I love and the planet we call home, to notice and refine that care. I need to believe the world is still beautiful because the work is not done, not for anyone, but black women, the liminal spaces in the hearts of the collective had been itching for acknowledgement in turn, living from them, breathing love into them. We have to find home in these black girl bodies. I found scars and love letters from those before me. They are all here and they're all riding for you, protecting you. We make the village, we give the call to action. We love, we break, we fall, we get the fuck back up. 
we're at peace, rinse, repeat, change the order. I need to believe the world is still beautiful for black women, for it's only black women that remind me every day that it is, and so it is. So every time we do it, she says whatever she wants to say. Um, this was actually the last time I spoke to you. Um, this was the work that I was making in Rome. I was the Bridget Riley Drawing Fellow um, in 2019. And um, I was living in this very grand building, very colonial building. And I realized that I was one of only a very small handful of black artists who'd ever been supported by this, which was meant to be a space where Br British artists come to be nurtured and nourished. And it's a very big honor to get these, to get this, um, fellowship uh, but I realized how it only really supports a certain type of person and perhaps my being there was a little bit token of a token but also it was to do with me having been to the Slade which is another very you know like traditional uh, like that it gives you a passport through these spaces in a way. And I was very conscious of that when I was living there and sleeping there within the institution. And um, so I started to make these works. First, first I didn't wanna make any work about black things cause I didn't want to, um, I, obviously Italy is very, um, a potent place to discuss immigration because of Lampedusa, but I didn't want to do anything to do with black pain in this place because art has a way of commodifying black pain. Um, so I, at the beginning I started off and I was like, I'm just gonna read and I'm just not gonna do anything except read, um, but to fulfill the, 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 the practical side, I will, uh, draw pictures only of white male ballet dancers from Google. And I was like, there's no context, there's no art history, historical anything, but this is what, this is the language this institution speaks in. So if I speak in that language and I do these beautiful drawings of these white male ballet dancers from Google, will they be viewed through the institution or will they be viewed as drawings by a black woman? And will I ever get away from the idea? I don't even, I don't know if I have, no, I don't think I have pictures of that. But, um, so I don't have pictures of the, of the white men, but yeah, so I spent the first half drawing white men. And then I was like, I don't wanna do this the whole time. Like then I'm just shooting myself in the foot. I've been given this beautiful opportunity and I don't wanna just always, like it becomes then again, I'm wasting my own time just being mad at this thing and not being able to kind of do anything. So, um, so I started to think about how to make work that um, honors the stories of black people, but doesn't insist a kind of, I don't know, that doesn't insist itself, but is truthful. And so I started making these black on black drawings. So they're black um, graphite on black paper. And um, they're very difficult to photograph because from some angles, you can't see the drawing at all. And then from, because of depending on the light and the angle, um, either you see it as a kind of silver or you see it as a gold if the sun is in the right place. Um, so I started making these uh, and then I was looking at um, it, it, stories of black deaths that had happened in Italy um, in recent history. Uh, I only took images that already existed in the media. Like I didn't take, I didn't want to take anything that wasn't already out there, but that, that, that perhaps existed in the media in ways that are crass and, and have been handled in a way that is not kind. Um, so this is a triptych of drawings 
um, of the widow of someone who was um, murdered um, in a racially aggravated attack. And these, these drawings come from photographs of her at the funeral of her husband. And um, she's there in this headdress and uh, very obviously like in deep grief but the pictures are really chaotic like there are people trying to touch her there's like microphones there's a lot going on in the pictures so I wanted to create these drawings to give her as a place for her to have some peace um, in order to grieve in in peace um, there, there was another story of uh a Senegalese street vendor who was shot dead on um, the Vespucci bridge in Florence and when in broad daylight and when they said this is racially aggravated the state said absolutely not we're not gonna we're not going to look at it like that and so the Senegalese community came out to protest and to say listen like we're literally being killed in the street you have to acknowledge that there's a racist element to society here and um in the protest some flower pots some state flower pots were knocked over and broken and then the press rather than talking about the murder that had occurred they started talking about the flower pots and the flower pots became the victims of this story like oh my god look at these hooligans who are now breaking state flower pots they don't care about florence they don't care about italy they're just you know thugs who are out here to break shit right and so um this is a four panel freeze um again it's this black on black so they look sometimes just like slabs of black. Um, and they're all the images I could find on either Facebook or on through the press of people who were at, who had attended that protest. Um, uh, they, I also, so, so, so then we had like the final th the show and um, on the night before we did the final show, I went into the courtyard of the British Academy and I stole flower pots uh, and I took them to the gallery and I smashed them in the middle of the gallery um, at midnight and uh, in solidarity and remembrance. Broken flower pots taken from the fountain of the British School of Rome without permission and um, I wanted, so the, so the next morning was the day of the show and I think the cleaning lady was the first to see this and she sent a text to someone else and eventually it got up to the director of the space, of the academy. And I wanted, I tried to hide in my studio because I wanted there to be a paper trail. I wanted him to write me a letter mm. so that that would be part of the work. And um, it became this whole thing. Everyone was like, Phoebe's done this terrible thing. And, and, um, and, I, and eventually I think they realized if they said anything, like it would look bad on them because they would become the state, right? Like it would become the same thing. So he eventually like caught me, I had to eat. So I had to go for lunch and then he caught me and he was like, so are you just gonna are you just gonna vandalize the whole building ha 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 and i was like no i'm not actually and he's like what do you expect me to do now like I, obviously i have to like i support you because like we care about you and your stuff but like i also have to know that you're not going to cross a line and burn the place down and da 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 da, da. And I was like, why don't you write this in a letter? And he was like, absolutely not. And then I think he told everyone to just be really nice. So everyone was so nice to me. And, um, and it was very, yeah, it was like just a very telling thing, but it began a process where they started to think about things differently. And um, 
when I left, the people who like I consider comrades <laughs> um, who stayed there, they they were like, no, we're doing we're having serious talks about who comes here, who gets these opportunities. And since then it's become a lot more um, diverse, let's say. Great. Did they remove the, the, the pots, the broken pots, or they left them? So, the, so the, this was interesting because obviously then it, it's similar to the thing um, in Kiev that then gets awarded. Mm. So these pots then, what happens to them? Do they become art? Like, so eventually like it became that, like it became art. I've got them in a, in a box and, um, and then I was invited to show the same, this work in Florence and we were talked about, you know, are you going to bring the flower pots? And I was like, no, but it, it doesn't have any direct value if I bring those because there's no, like we have to find another in. So, so we talked a lot about it and eventually we, t we decided we would get flower pots because this was obviously Florence where the thing had happened. So we decided to get flower pots that um of the of the state flower and uh florentian people who had anger about this were the ones who smashed them in the gallery so so i tried to keep the same energy um but yeah like what happens because then um it was invited to cambridge and they were like, but we want the pots. And I was like, but they have no meaning. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And so I said no to doing that. Um, because yeah, then everything just becomes a commodity. Everything just becomes this commodifiable yes. thing. Um, I got back to London and I was given my first major public work in um, a railway station in Geneva uh where they gave me these two uh mega screens these two massive led mega screens which faced each other across a platform and i was thinking about how we see or fail to see each other as we move around cities and um so i invited people again i invited people to um, send in their self-authored photographs and to finish the sentence, I am. Um, and then, so this was the final, so, and then I set up a, a rig in my studio and I would press, I made like a stop motion and I pressed record and then I would draw these people as they, as I hope they desired to be seen. And it was, and I wouldn't stop until either I got so tired and then that became the work or until I thought that I'd captured something about the person. And it became this thing that very much in my mind was about love, um, about trying to see someone as they are, not as you wish them. And, th and drawing became the endeavor of love. Like it became, instead, it didn't really matter if I succeeded or not, but the point was that I tried. Like, so for, nine hours every day I tried to see you um so uh the the work is so here it is on the platform um so so the drawing comes and as as the face starts to emerge then the eyes start to blink and start to look around and start to come to life and look at each other and then and then it gets erased. And as it gets erased and taken away, then their statement, I am. So this here, it says, I am a citizen. And here it says, oh, this one doesn't say I am. For some reason I allowed it, but it says it is a time for new dreams. So here it is as in, with the train. Um, and what I didn't know, know because because you can't know, um, is that when the train comes, this is what you see from the thing. So I was so happy when I got sent these because I haven't managed to see it myself because it was unveiled just bef just during COVID actually. So it was meant to be a big reveal. And then obviously it had to be this very quiet 
thing and I haven't yet got to see it. Um, this is a version that I really want to do in, um, in a gallery. Um, but yeah, like, so, so my hand kind of becomes like, like little people and like little people on the, on the platform. So this is, um, a few excerpts. So is it going to be realized in some gallery space soon? I hope so, but it's a, it's one of these things with 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 moving image work. It's always very um, they like the gallery would have to have the right tech, the right um, budget. These these like Mutumia, this like they're all very um, expensive works to run mm -hmm. over time. So. I would love it. Like, imagine you're standing there. I just really want to see it. But so far, it's not happening anywhere. But we'll see. So, so you can see the eyes starting to blink. Mm -hmm. How long it took you to realize this? This was another nine months. I, it seems like everything is like the size of a baby. <laughs> <laughs> It's always the same, <laughs> nine, ten months like that, but intense, like a very, very, very heavy nights, no sleep. And you never um, use for animation digital uh, media, it's always hand drawn, right? So this was kind of digital because I just set my camera to do every two seconds. And then the, the animation part was the eyes, which, um, which took a long time, but it was done. So I would draw, I drew them by hand and then I scanned them in and then I use After Effects to uh, composite them, which is the same with everything. Like I, I always use a mixture of, I'm not at all um, like precious about not using technology. Like I use it as much as I need it when I, when mm. I need it. Um, so that's that. This, this was in the show in Nottingham recently and I showed the original drawings alongside screen versions of, of the moving image. Um, then we come to now and then I'm nearly done. So, um, so we come to COVID. Um, I'm missing one project that I do wanted to show you, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, so we come to now, we come to doing everything on Zoom. Um, again, I was looking at trying to find myself through self-portraiture. This was drawn on Zoom during meetings, um, interested in the medium, interested in, in the thing that happens when you, when Zoom flips you, um, interested in the gaze, like, where does your eye look when you're in a pandemic? Like, can we ever look directly at anything when we're in a pandemic? Um, and then my time during the pandemic has been very fluctuating. So at the beginning, I became completely like, because everything was canceled. So it kind of gave permission to do nothing. And I just became like obsessed with like Korean face masks and moisturizing and <laughs> looking at the view. <laughs> and I just, I was like, I don't, no one needs me to work. So why am I gonna work? So I didn't really do much um, for the first lockdown. The second lockdown, I felt very paranoid. Like I had a lot of uh, anxiety and I felt like it was the summer one and everyone was, lots of more people were going out and I wasn't yet ready to go out. And so I just felt very uncertain about myself. And then finally, this was the third lockdown and I suddenly was like, okay, like, so, like I need to, again, move, like use art to get me through this because this has been too long, too much, too 
not seeing anyone to no touch to you know everything so I started to draw and I would just sit here um, I would very rarely go to the studio but I would sit here um, and draw whatever so there are lots of self-portraits um, uh, I, I because we all became so digital so there are lots of self-portraits to do with like filters on Instagram um, simultaneously obviously there was a lot to do happening with Black Lives Matter and uh, kind of the performance of the performance of activism more than like the reality of activism like there was a lot of virtue signaling online and all of these things so I was interested in this cry emoji this cry filter thing mm. um facetime like how we be together when we can't be together um then i was doing these more intense um self-portraits uh then i was drawing a lot from the screen so this was like not being able to get signal then i was drawing a lot from instagram so this is Jerry Salt saying, I just want to be touched again. Um, this says, needs social interaction, interacts with people, gets overwhelmed, fatigue, isolates, missed my friends, needs social interaction. Um, so yeah, so this was um, Zoom, but with the, when you can put like a little background. So this was Zoom, but I was, it was when that the thing went up to Mars so it's called Zoom, but Mars. And I was like imagining that I was in Mars. Um, this was actually the post that made me start drawing. Um, this very dear person on Twitter wrote, how are you looking after your heart today? And I was super excited that I finally started drawing again. So this became a drawing um, to like kind of just honor the moment. Then I, tentatively started going back to the studio which was very close to my house so I could walk along the river I don't need public transport or anything so um so I would do these walks along the river to the studio and signage started to become like very personified and I started to like get like messages through sign through the like road signs um I also started to draw to use watercolor which I've never done before I think I wanted to do something that was outside of my, um, I wanted to get, develop some, some new skill. So this was my first watercolor. Um, and I started doing these watercolors of different signs that I was seeing as I was going to the studio. Amazing and to that see the colors. actually it, I know, like for me, and so color became like, I don't know, I'm starting to use color now. I'm a bit, yeah. Colour is becoming a bit of a portal for me to think about various things. So. Yeah, because through the talk, I was I was preparing to ask you the question, uh, what's up with the colour? Why, yeah. <laughs> why, why colour was was never kind of a, uh, a side uh, in your practice? Well, occasionally we saw a bit, but uh, in general, it yeah. never... Yeah. No, actually, the, the what I'm working on now, it's called Future Ancestors. Um, and I don't actually have the images of it to show you, but um, I'm using color in that. And I'm thinking very much about color as a, so this, this work is to do with um, these fishermen who I encountered. And I started to imagine that they were the characters who were like going on this journey to find a new place for us. And this happened just before the pandemic. So I did the first drawings just before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit and suddenly I was like, wow, we really need to think of a new place. Like this is really essential now that we start to imagine portals to a new space. And so color became this way for me to to push myself out because, because we need an imagination that goes beyond our lived experience. And that's so difficult. Like always the imagination is limited by what we already know. 
And so how do we push out of that necessarily? Like, how do we push out of capitalism necessarily? Because like, we know capitalism. Mm. So like, how do we push? Yeah, so, so color and attempting color became this way of being like, what does it, what does red mean? What does blue mean? How do I get lost in green, you know? And um, so, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm working on now. And that's it. That's the last slide. I feel like I've been talking for... <laughs> Phoebe, it was amazing. It's such a such an incredible uh, talk, so moving. And uh, I don't know, I'm just uh, really, really impressed. Well, so there's some comments in the, in the, in the chat which you can look through as well. Oh. Uh, maybe there, there is some questions. There are some questions. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, first of all, Phoebe, thank you so much uh, for your story and for being here tonight. This is uh, just amazing. And, uh, you know, I honestly, I got a feeling like you're a very charming person and incredible artist. Oh, <laughs> so thank, thank you for you. that. Thank um, you. That's so kind. I have a question um, about the following thing. Uh, I was uh, uh, hearing you and I realized that it's so much meaning in your artworks and it's a lot of things so as an artist uh, how much do you think about um, how clear it is for your audience do you want them investigate and uh, follow different hints and uh, to uh, unfold the story step by step or you want it like more straightforward so and do you think about it at all or you just I don't know, follow your heart and inspiration. Um, thank you. That's really kind of you. Um, I, the audience really is important to me. Like I, I want to connect with you. Uh, I don't want to tell you what to think and I don't want to tell you what experience you should have. Um, I try and make work that has multiple inroads so you can meet it where you are and my desire is that you feel yourself or you sense yourself in the work whatever that means and and so like I don't limit I don't want to limit um meaning to my because I who am I to have to 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 know how to speak to you, I can only try and say truthfully, like have some kind of authentic expression. And then you, my desire is that you then come with your own authentic expression. And I feel like maybe it's more to do with like a vulnerability. Like I think that when people meet my work, they feel perhaps a vulnerable, vulnerable in a, in this powerful sense of vulnerable that like they can kind of lay down their armor for a minute and think about uh themselves and and their their worlds um so yeah so i don't want to be prescriptive i don't want to tell you a story and for that story to be solid like i want it to have holes in it and i want it to 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 ask you questions perhaps and I don't want to give you answers because I'm not an authority on anything except my own truth right and the truth that I believe that we are all we have and we are all we need so when I, when you come to me I believe that for you as well like I believe that I'm here for you and you're also here for me I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, really. Maybe there's a question in the chat. It says, what was the most difficult thing during your experience as an artist? That's a question from Irina. Oh. Um, I, think, I think a constant difficult thing is self-doubt, maybe. I think that, I don't know, I think that we all get kind of plagued by 
by doubt and doubt and hypocrisy because I'm very conscious that the art world is a space that is very inextricably linked to capitalism, which is inextricably linked to patriarchy, white supremacy, all the things that make the world, the, the hierarchies of the world exist as they do. And I think the, one, the most difficult thing is to exist in this space where you're always a little bit of a hypocrite because like, you know, you make work that you think means something and then it gets swallowed by this monster and you do well within that scenario. And so, so I think it's, it's, it's always a battle to remain kind of as close to my understanding of truth while simultaneously existing in this world that doesn't fully see me and also eats from the plate that I, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, well, to me, it totally makes sense. I don't know whether it's answered the question. Uh, Did it not answer the question? <laughs> no, no, I think, I think Irina got your point. So that's mm -hmm. definitely good. Cool. There's also a question from Natalia. First of all, Shirad Phoebe, thank you so much. Your works are so beautiful and interesting. You are so deeply exploring people, women, their emotions, life, nationalities. Do you think there are differences between women of different nationalities or does a woman as a person not depend on this? Um, well, firstly, I think that definitions of men and women, I, my own understanding is, is shifting. Um, I'm l trying to learn as much as I can about gender um, because I think that this is a very freeing space to, to, to understand like the, the spectrum that can exist, I think, and that we're learning exists. So when I speak of women, I speak of it in the most inclusive way possible. Um, and because of that, I, I, the question was, do you think there are differences between women of different? Because of that, I think there's nuance in everything. And I don't think anything is prescriptive. I don't think women are prescriptive. I don't think men are prescriptive. I think that if we, the, the categorization of human beings in any way, um, racially, sexually, everything, leads to a very close-minded uh, world. And what I want to do is push out of that. So um, I think we all have massive differences and we also all, all share the same thing. Like we share, uh, the same uh, values and understanding of what it means to be human. Uh, and the sooner we kind of uh, fall in love with that idea, the better, I think. Mm. Yes, thanks. Um, Phoebe, uh, there's another question. Have you ever been to had the exhibitions in Russia, if so, can you share your experience? But I think you haven't. I haven't. Yes. I haven't. I want to, but I've never been. Actually, I, I was telling someone that I was doing this today and they thought I was physically coming. Oh, and right. they, were, they were like, oh my God, they were so excited for me. And I was like, no, I'm just <laughs> doing it on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we we definitely need to think of how to arrange it. And I would uh, love to. No, I would really love to. I feel like it would be such a expansive experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Right. Well, um, I think on that note, we I think we 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 had an incredible evening. 
and uh, I, I'm so grateful for Zoom that we can record this so we can actually have the record of the of your talk and uh, I really do hope that uh, we would be able to somehow support and arrange maybe in the future your visit to I Moscow because I, I would love to have you over and uh, you know for sure Zoom is a wonderful thing but uh, having physical uh, experience of meeting, talking and everything that definitely cannot Yeah, be and done. seeing all of your work. I'd love to see all of your work, so. Yeah. So there are a couple more questions, if, uh, if you don't mind maybe answering this. Could you tell us about your favorite artists? Ooh. Do, do they mean to you and what exactly do they inspire? Um, it changes all the time. I love uh, Deneo Seshi Bopape. She's a South African artist. I love Kamang Walahulare. He's another uh, South African artist. I love, um, I'm, I just went to see Paula Rego. I'm obsessed with her uh, pastels. Like I couldn't get enough of her pastels. Um, Jennifer Packer. Um, an American artist, uh, painter. I've never really been excited about painting, but I, I had, I stopped myself. I, like I literally just stared at a wall in my studio for the week after I saw her work because <laughs> I was so blown away by it. Um, who else? Um, uh, who else? Um, there's a Kenyan artist called Wangari Mathengi who is very new. She's just out of uh, Chicago Art Institute and she's, um, her paintings are so joyous. Um, I could go on, but like it changes all the time. At the moment, those are Noah Davis who passed away very sadly, but um, has an abundance of like incredibly poignant, Paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm into paintings right now. William Kentridge, yes. his animations. Mm -hmm. Like that, uh, there's always That's linking a clear to link. Him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I asked him to be, I asked if I could be his apprentice once. He absolutely was like, no. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> No. when I was and, at art uh, school. Sorry, there's, there's one more question. Mm. Um, Natalia, uh, excuse me for the commercial question. Do you sell your works or do, the, do you receive money from museums that order your works? Um, so a bit of both. So I have a gallery in New York. Um, it's a very small gallery called Sapar Contemporary. Um, it was interesting. So they flew over to London to do a studio visit just before my eye happened. And they gave me a show, a solo show. And then the eye happened and I had to cancel. And they were just very kind. And they, and it, the show would have been able to happen without me, but they were like, no, we want you to, you know, experience your first show in America. Like, so they changed their whole schedule according to this thing and they, you know, like the director called my family every day to check on me, even though we'd only met once. And so I, you should never make decisions when you're in a weird space. But I said yes to representation while I was going through all of that stuff. And it was, it was really good because it made me feel at least I was still connected even when I was like in a bad space. It was, it felt, good to have some advocacy um, uh, and they've been great like I um, I sell well with them but they're also not so big that they can tell me what to do too much um, uh, so I like that I like it that they're not um, they're not very well I have liked it that they're not very showy but I feel like maybe I'm growing out of them now or we've been together for a while it's like being married you know like you have to choose the right person <laughs> and um and I feel yeah we're I I think we're maybe at a place where I don't know we'll see but um but yeah I've done I sell with them 
through the gallery they've also been really kind to me they've given me a lot of um, fairs so I I've done armory like a solo booth at armory with them I did Expo Chicago solo again with them so they they because they're small they're very hungry and they give you pride of place like you're not just one artist amongst a whole bunch of other artists so I felt very held um, uh, so yeah so they represent me in America only I'm not represented in the UK or in Europe, um, which is kind of a semi conscious choice. Um, I haven't met a gallery that I've wanted to work with here. Um, I've done shows with galleries, but I've never wanted to commit to them. Um, I think I also, it's fine to have this um, money side happening in America in dollars because it doesn't feel that real to me. Um, I think that if I had something here, it might change. So don't quote me on this because probably I'll sell out in like five minutes. But at the moment, it feels good to be free here because what I like doing more is the bigger work, the more um, museum work. And how that usually works is they commission you. Um, uh, I'll be super honest because I think we should all be honest together as artists. The artist fee is always very low. Like if you really looked at it, you as the artist gets less than the janitor of the museum, gets less than the technicians, gets less. Ultimately, once your show is up, you don't earn that much from it, but they pay for your production. So um so some artists will you know hustle a bit and they'll say oh the production is this and then they'll take more of a fee from that um uh but yeah like I um it it's one of those things that is a bit of a dark spot um I don't know Misha if you have this a similar uh thing around it that yeah, like artists don't get paid properly to show their work usually. And um, it's a thing that should change. Mm. Um, we should have better unions, I think, but there's always gonna be an artist who says yes. So, um, and you also want to, like you want to, I always want to be in the spaces that I show in. Um, recently, um, I did, uh, Thing at Christie's which was my first time in an auction house and, and it was the worst experience so like I've never been treated more badly than by the posh people at Christie's like I hated going there I hated the building I hated the air I hated the people it was just a nasty the nastiest experience and they treat you like they don't because they're not used to maybe to working with living artists they're just used to handling artwork and they handle it like commodity like if it's worth a lot of money they'll be very good to it and so yeah I had a between us I had a bad experience <laughs> um but it's one of those necessary things uh and what else like I do some teaching um as much as I can without being having to do admin because I'm very bad at admin so um, so I do just enough visiting, lecturing to, because I enjoy it a lot. Like I like being with students. I like chatting. I like all of this. And then during COVID, obviously Zoom um, means everyone has wanted, has, like there's been a lot more um, invitations like this, which does eventually, because you, because yeah, like if, if you, you could you get paid for these things sometimes and um so that has been a little bit of a of a lifeline um in europe you get paid a certain amount in america you get paid more and i kind of straddle both so uh so yeah i don't know like i again it's one of those hypo hypocrisy things like i don't like talking about money but i am very grateful that i 
for the moment I'm doing okay and I feel like my prices are getting weirdly weird but people who love the work can still buy the work and that's what I want like I I'm very I never want with my gallery they know to check who's buying the work because I think that matters as well yes for sure right PB um again uh thank you so much uh, really it's been so wonderful to hear you talking to him about the projects your life and everything it's very touching and uh uh, for me especially, because uh, I've known you for what, almost 20 years now. I know, imagine. Yes. Imagine. So, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> to hear over the years uh, with what's been happening, you know, it's, it's so wonderful. Hopefully we can again invite you and see you in Moscow in oh, the near future. Let's manifest that. Let's make that happen. Yes. <laughs> And good luck with everything, everyone. And I hope you come out of lockdown soon. Yes, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much again. Best of luck with your shows. I will definitely um, follow up. And hopefully in the near future, I can see one of the shows in real life and maybe yes. we can visit with the students. <gasps> that would be amazing. Shows. That yeah. would be so nice um yeah like keep in touch on instagram phoebe.boswell on instagram and will you save this chat because i haven't had a chance to read it will yes, you yes yes i will send, send it to me? i will send it over to you and thank you so much share the the recording and everything fantastic all right everyone thank you again have a lovely evening likewise thank you bye again. bye, -bye.